All right, so welcome to my talk, Ghost in the Machine, Challenges in uh, Embedded Binary Security. As uh, already introduced, my name is uh, Jos Wetzels, and I'm a researcher at the Distributed and Embedded Systems Security Group at the University of Twente in the Netherlands. And I did this research together with my colleague, Ali Abassi, who's a researcher at the same group and also at the Ruhr University uh, of Bochum in Germany. So I'd like to start my presentation off with two claims. One, embedded binary security lags behind the general purpose world significantly. And two, catching up in this regard will be non-trivial due to embedded constraints. And I'd like to explore the rationale behind these claims in, uh, in this talk. So what's embedded binary security all about? Well, binary security is about memory corruption. And memory corruption ranks among the most common embedded vulnerabilities out there. As shown in the pie chart on the slide behind me by uh, Kaspersky, in industrial control systems, which are relatively representative of embedded systems in general, buffer overflows compromise the biggest single category of vulnerabilities. And this is largely due to the fact that embedded development is dominated by the C language, which, as many of you will know, is an unsafe language. Someone once said, C is a terse and unforgiving abstraction of silicon. And this makes it really easy for developers to introduce such vulnerabilities into their code. So what's the impact of memory corruption vulnerabilities in embedded systems? Well, in order to explore this a little, I'd like to draw your attention to a recent incident, the Shadow Brokers incident. Here, uh, uh, an unknown hacker group managed to obtain exploit code and implant code used by another hacker group, the so-called Equation APT group, which is a very high-level threat actor, and they released it. And among these exploits, there were exploits for various network security equipment devices, such as Fortinet, Cisco, and TopSec firewalls, and intrusion detection systems. And these, these are used in highly sensitive environments. But what really stood out is that none of the memory corruption vulnerabilities in this exploit set bypassed any known exploit mitigations that were common to seeing in the general purpose world. And as the tweet on the slide shows, it's an interesting question to ask how many of these zero days would have been fully or at least partially mitigated if vendors had enabled basic anti-exploit mitigations in their products. So why exploit mitigations? As Ben Hawkes pointed out during his talk at last year's Enigma conference, exploits are essentially chains. And in order to complicate exploit development, you need to lengthen the chain by introducing new uh, exploit mitigations. So attackers need to find new bugs to bypass these. Or you need to harden individual links by making the exploit mitigations that exist more robust. So some of you will ask, why focus on exploit mitigations? Why not tackle things at the root by using safe languages, for example? Well, that's a very good question, but especially in the embedded world, that's not gonna happen anytime soon. First of all, you're dealing with portability issues. There's a C tool chain for nearly every platform and operating system out there, and that's not the case for most uh, safe languages. Secondly, you're dealing with functionality constraints. C is very close to metal, so you have access to functionality that's not available in, uh, in most safe languages. Thirdly, performance is really critical for embedded systems, especially those dealing with real-time constraints. And finally, there simply are existing code bases of billions and billions of lines of legacy C code that aren't gonna be ported anytime soon. So we need short-term solutions, and we believe exploit mitigations to be such a solution. So when we're talking about exploit mitigations, which mitigations are we talking about? Well, mainly we're talking about a complementary baseline of executable space protection, also known as DEP, exact shield or write execute protection, address space layout randomization, and stack canaries, also known as stack cookies. And towards the end of the talk, we'll talk a little bit about advanced mitigations such as control flow integrity. So for those of you unfamiliar with how these, these mitigations uh, work in a complementary fashion, consider a traditional stack buffer overflow. Here the attacker overflows a stack buffer and usually overrides a saved return address. And this is where stack uh, canaries or cookies come in because an attacker will have to know a secret value in order to properly override this address and hijack control flow. And then when they do this, they overwrite a saved return address or any code pointer uh, in general. Uh, with a shellcode address or an ROP gadget. And this is where address space randomization comes in by effectively ensuring memory layout secrecy. And finally, by making data memory non-executable, by using executable space protection, we force attackers to use ROP chains. So we evaluated 36 popular embedded operating systems for support of such mitigations and found that under half of them have executable space protection. 
22% uh, of them have address space layout randomization support, and one third of them have stack canary support. So this is way, way lower than you find in uh, operating systems in the general purpose world. And this is even worse if you consider that the embedded systems are very diverse. Smartphones, uh, network equipment, and avionics equipment is not the same as industrial control systems or card readers, which are much more constrained systems. And if you look at the operating systems which are used in these most constrained devices, we find that only 15% of them have executable space protection, 5% have stack canary support, and none of them have address space layered randomization support. So this is, this is a terrible situation. So what are the reasons behind the, the lack of this support? Is it simply laziness on part of the vendors, or are there more well-reasoned uh, reasons for this, this absence? Well, it turns out that if you map out the dependencies in terms of operating system features or hardware features uh, that are required for such mitigations, there are reasonable reasons not to, uh, to adopt this, or which are in the way of adoption. So let's start with address space layout randomization. Address space layout randomization works by guaranteeing secrecy of memory layout by randomizing uh, the location of memory objects in memory. In order to do this, you need a random number generator to a secure random number generator to properly randomize these memory objects. You need virtual memory in order to prevent shared memory conflicts. And in order to support virtual memory on part of the operating system, you need a memory management unit, or MMU, on part of the hardware. So we looked at these same uh, operating systems we evaluated earlier uh, and checked whether they had virtual memory support. And it turns out that under half of them have virtual memory support when looking at, at all of the operating systems. But when we eliminate the Linux, BSD, and Windows-based versions of these uh, operating systems, we found that only 17.1% of them have actual support for virtual memory. And among the most constrained operating systems, none of them have because these, these small constrained operating systems often have real-time requirements which conflict with virtual memory. So this eliminates a key dependency for ASLR. When it comes to executable space protection, you need to realize that CPUs have two main architectural styles. The first of which is the Harvard style, where you have separate program memory and separate data memory, so you trivially have uh, executable space protection. And the other style is the, the, the von Neumann architecture, where you have a single view of memory, and all the memory is usually executable by default. So in order to implement ESP here, there are two main approaches, either a hardware-based or a software-based one. And the hardware-based one relies on a dedicated hardware feature, such as the Intel NX bit, where you regulate executability of memory on a per-page granularity level. And at the software uh, version, such as the Linux PAX, pro PAX project, you emulate this functionality in software, which does impose some overhead. So we evaluated 51 popular embedded core families for support of hardware features on which this, uh, these, these executable space protection implementations rely. And we found that under half of them have support for hardware ESP. So this means that all the, the uh, embedded devices where you deploy um, these, these uh, embedded cores where you don't have hardware ESP support, you will need software ESP support. So, and this software ESP support imposes additional overhead. But regardless of the way in which you implement your executable space protection, you will need memory protection support on part of the operating system. In order to provide this, you will need a memory management unit or a more slimmed down version in the form of an MPU. And as you can see on the, uh, in the, on the chart on the, uh, on the slide behind me, under half of them have support for an MMU, and only 11.5% of them have support for an MPU. So this means that there is a big gap area of devices where no such support is available. So when it comes to stack canaries, stack canaries work by compiling your code with stack canary support. So if you do it without a stack canary support, you have a stack frame, and uh, you have your local buffer, and right above that is the uh, saved return address. So an attacker overflowing this buffer can trivially override the saved return address and hijack control flow. But if you compile it with stack canary support, then you draw from a secure random number generator and place a secret canary value in between. So upon returning from your function and, and uh, popping this saved return address from the stack, it checks whether the secret, the secret canary value is equal to a saved master value. And if it's not, it doesn't uh, pop the saved return address and you cannot hijack control flow. So 
in order to, to securely generate random numbers, you need a secure random number generator. And implementing this is non-trivial, so usually you rely on one provided by your operating system, such as the DEF, your random device on Unix-like systems. We evaluated the, the aforementioned embedded operating systems for OS, CSP, or NG support, and we found that under half of them have support for such uh, a secure random number generator. But if you look again at the non-Linux, BSD, and Windows-based operating systems, this support rapidly drops to, I think, 22.2%. And it's even worse, of course, if you look at the most constrained of these operating systems. And this eliminates the key dependency of stack canary support. And also for ASLR, because it also requires a secure random number generator for securely randomizing memory objects. So that doesn't look good, right? How are we going to address these problems and how are we going to move forward from here? Let's start with ESP. One of the ways to deal with this ESP problem would be on part of the vendors by using Harvard architecture CPUs wherever possible, such as the AVR architecture, for example, or when using a von Neumann core, using one with hardware ESP support, ARM v6+, plus, uh, x86, MIPS uh, 32 after release 3. These are all very good choices. But that still leaves an area of devices where it's simply not possible, especially in the, in the most constrained devices. And here we have two major open problems. One open problem is that there is a real need for a multi-architecture, low overhead software ESP implementation for all embedded operating systems. Because currently there exists software ESP for Linux in the form of the, the PAX project, but this simply isn't available for all these other operating systems in the embedded space, and we need an alternative for this. And secondly, we need to find a way to deal with embedded devices that don't have a memory protection unit or a memory management unit to even support this. And this is an open problem that, uh, that we'd very much like to see work on. When it comes to ASLR, the, the limitations simply are too fundamental. Uh, we likely won't see virtual memory adoption across all embedded operating systems because it conflicts with a lot of design criteria that are more important, such as real-timeness. And similarly, we won't see MMUs being deployed in all hardware devices across the board because it's very costly. So here we need a real embedded alternative for ASLR. And one way to think about this without requiring virtual memory support is to think about ASLR as runtime diversification. So potential alternatives that don't require virtual memory support are compile time or install time diversification. The downside of these approaches, of course, is that they are less effective because you only diversify between different software builds or different devices and not different runs of the same piece of software. And you only diversify code memory and not data memory. So this is an area that requires some additional work. When it comes to secure random number generators, which are a key dependency of a lot of these, these mitigations, the embedded world is, is kind of a mess. Uh, you cannot trivially port existing uh, designs from the general purpose world to the uh, embedded world, as, as we discussed a little in our uh, last CCC uh, talk at uh, this year's CCC about anal analysis of embedded random number generators. And here, one of the key problems is the fact that you don't have a lot of entropy in the uh, embedded world. In the general purpose world, when you need to draw entropy for your random number generator, you usually do so by using the user as the most nonlinear thing available. So you draw upon keyboard input, mouse movements, disk access times, et cetera, et cetera. And there have been a lot of embedded random number generator proposals but which were very specific to a particular application domain. And they drew upon sensor values, uh, microphones, uh, radio chips, et cetera, et cetera. But when you're designing an embedded operating system, you cannot assume the existence of such sources across all the devices that your OS is going to be deployed in. So we really need an alternative here. And ideally, that would be an omnipresently available on-chip, high-throughput, true random number generator but we're not gonna see these rolled out in all embedded devices all across the board. So when we're gonna focus on software-based pseudo-random number generators, two fruitful areas of research to focus on and to, to develop alternatives are lightweight cryptography, such as the research done by the Acrypt project, or the evaluation of the suitability and the quality of omnipresent entropy sources, such as ASRAM startup values or clock jitter. So let's, let's look a little uh, to the future. Um, after these if and when these, these um, mitigation problems have been addressed, we need to look towards more advanced mitigations. And one of these is control flow integrity for high-end embedded systems. 
For those of you unfamiliar with the concept, um, C of I enforces that a program's execution flow conforms to uh, a control flow graph. So it's effectively a subgraph matching problem as shown on the slide. And this is being rolled out currently in the general purpose world in the form of Microsoft uh, Control Flow Guard, Clang CFI, or the uh, PAX uh, return address project, uh, protection support. But we're not likely to see this kind of support um, migrate to the embedded world anytime soon because of se several key um, limitations in the embedded world. First of all, in the embedded world, you need low worst case runtime and memory overheads, especially in industrial control systems, rather than average case overheads that are common in most CFI uh, implementations. Secondly, you need real-time friendliness, so you need predictable deterministic response times on part of your mitigations. Thirdly, availability preservation is very important in some areas of the embedded world, especially the industrial control world. Um, think about it a little. If a mitigation were to shut down a violating application because it detects an attack, then the actual result of your mitigation uh, stepping in could be worse than an attacker payload executing if that particular application is, for example, a PLC runtime in a nuclear power plant. You want that thing to be up and running all the time. Um, also very important is commercial off-the-shelf binary support uh, because you find a lot of closed source binaries in a lot of embedded systems such as drivers, PLC runtimes, etc., etc. And these need to be protected even though vendors might not have access to the source code themselves. And finally, any CFI solution that is to see widespread adoption in the embedded world is supposed to be hardware agnostic. So you cannot rely on features such as Intel CET, LBR, or PMU, which underpin a lot of uh, common CFI solutions which have great performance. So in order to address some of these issues, the research we have been involved in uh, as part of the European Union's preemptive project for the protection of critical infrastructure are the MicroShield and the eCFI solutions. And papers about these are forthcoming, so I can't present any out, uh, some broad details, but the prototype source code for MicroShield is available at the bottom of the slide. And MicroShield is a commercial off-the-shelf binary supporting uh, CFI solution for embedded systems with additional heuristics. And eCFI does require source code access, but it offers real-time friendliness. So to give you an idea of, of how these solutions work, uh, MicroShield is pictured on the slide. Um, it works by taking a binary, closed source binary, any binary, and pulling it through a binary analysis framework and then extracting all the functions using, for example, IDA. And then after it has identified all the functions, it uh, identifies their prologues and their epilogues and instruments them with a sh parallel shadow stack and a forward edge heuristic, and it adds some additional heuristics such as stack frame integrity walking, kernel ESP enforcement, and a minimal sandbox. And it also has uh, availability preservation measures in its responses. So there are two ways to go about this. Either you only log alerts after you detect an attack and you don't do anything else, so you allow the attacker payload to execute, which can be um, the, the least worst of the, the, the possible scenarios in, an, uh, in a sensitive situation, or you simply uh, do a clean device reset and you clean memory upon reboot. So you keep downtime to a minimum. So I'd like to finish this presentation with a call to action. Uh, it's important we keep uh, raising awareness and show the impact of, uh, of vulnerabilities in embedded systems. Secondly, it's really important we start focusing on short-term solutions. So some of the, the limitations in uh, embedded mitigations that we, we are currently seeing should be addressed by researchers. And it's very important on part of operating system developers to actually start adopting these mitigations once they have been properly uh, rolled out for embedded systems. And finally, we need to focus on long-term solutions as well, because just exploit mitigations aren't going to cut it. So here we need to focus on embedded safe language uh, adoption, secure embedded patching and updating. The uh, Federal Trade Commission recently uh, issued a $25,000 uh, prize for uh, an Internet of Things a secure patching and updating mechanism. So that should be some incentive. And there is a real need for Internet of Things standardization, regulation, and policy. So we start having security by design right from the get-go instead of stitching it on afterwards. And uh, that is that. <laughs>